Many of you I know have uh, worked on these uh, conventions, and I'm sure you know that uh, there are a lot of problems, a lot of headaches. Uh, sometimes you wish you hadn't even done it to begin with. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, you, you come across a real pleasant task. And uh, introducing the next speaker is certainly a, a pleasant task for me, because uh, she's a lady I uh, respect very much, admire. I know you all know her. Uh, she really doesn't need any introduction. However, I will say that she's a, a very well-known authoress. She's written a number of books. She received the uh, Burroughs Award for her book, Flight into Sunshine. Uh, her most recent book was Paradise of Birds. I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it. She is an outstanding naturalist. A uh, very excellent wildlife photographer in her own right. And of course, I'm referring to Helen Crookshank of Rockledge, who is going to uh, give a program of some of her own color slides of birds of this particular area. I'm very pleased to present Helen Crookshank. Thank you, Carl. Wasn't that lovely, the things he had to say about me? And I'm so glad you're all here and especially happy that Beth Johnson could be here today. Uh, often we have effective senators, but we ha seldom find one as beautiful to look at. And we also rarely find one who uh, does her homework in conservation with the skill and thoroughness that our Senator Beth does. She's as good as our... So I want to say welcome to you all here. And because there are so many nationally known wildlife uh, photographers among this group, while I'm just a sort of go along with a camera type who loves first of all to watch wildlife at close range, I've taken the liberty of changing slightly from the topic which was assigned to me instead of just colorful birds of Florida I'm going to restrict what I show you to this specific section of Central Boulevard an area that some of you know very well but others only slightly and perhaps some of you not at all I shall by no means show you photographs of even half of the species recorded in Central Boulevard. For 17 years, 19 years, we've conducted Christmas bird counts here, and that means 19 um, midwinter days over a period of 19 years. And during that time, on those 19 days, 271 species of birds have been recorded. So you can see why I'm not going to show you even half of that number. In showing you the birds I have photographed, I am very appreciative to Ken West, our projectionist. He is one of our former presidents who will make sure the projection is good, and if everything isn't perfect, it won't be his fault. So now if we may have the lights out, <coughs> let's skip very lightly back through time to the 16th century. When Ponce de Leon landed on the North American continent in March of 1513, he named the newly discovered land Florida because it was a time of uh, the Feast of Flowers probably the only conspicuous flower then in bloom on the coastal dunes were the massive clusters of yucca gloriosa birds must have been the lights didn't go out did they i'm, I'm sorry there we go we might really <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how to back up. <laughs> there we are. And this is the Yucca Gloriosa, which Ponce de Leon may have seen. And the birds that must have been present at that time in vast numbers. 
But if De Leon took note of them, we're not aware of it, for the records of that entire expedition have been lost. It is believed on good evidence that De Leon named Cape Canaveral at that time. As decade followed decade, we find little about wild life, though many a shipwrecked sailor and Indian captive reported his experiences on the Cape. But if a new day was dawning for Florida, specific information about wildlife in the vicinity of Cape Canaveral is hidden in the mists of time. In 1773, William Bartram, who described the strange limpkins he saw on the St. John's River, visited the New Smyrna area for the second time, and he mentioned that he was only 30 miles from Cape Canaveral, and that's all he had to say about this area. Because of frequent shipwrecks, a lighthouse burning whale oil, of all things, was built on Cape Canaveral in 1848. Now this is the new lighthouse built in 1893 because the first one was being washed into the sea by erosion. In 1853 Captain Mills Burnham became lightkeeper and at last we began to hear something about the birds. He mentioned Carolina parakeets, now extinct sweeping through the groves of wild orange trees on, um, beside the, uh, the uh, Banana River. Now, Captain Burnham was also impressed by great flocks of roseate spoonbills that assembled on the shores of the Banana River. He called them pink curlews. And he watched as they perched, uh, as they bathed along the river. And today they still give, give us... Uh, pleasure as they come to this area after the breeding season farther north. In those pioneer days before there were e either a cook stoves or screened windows or doors, the Burnhams lived chiefly off the land. Then there were always plenty of waterfowl available for the pot. But when tired of waterfowl, a bear was always readily available. When they tired of bear, they could easily vary their diet with a deer. Fawns at that time had to be very alert for predators, weeded out the wick, the weak, or the careless. But I expect nobody in this room has ever seen their chief predator in the wild in this part of Brevard. The only Florida panther or cougar I have seen is Prince, belonging to one of our members, Dave Salisbury. Now life changed slowly and with dignity through the decades that followed and distinguished ornithologists made short visits to the area but no day in, day out records were kept. Then in 1949, dredging of Canaveral Bight for Port Canaveral was begun. This created a new habitat for birds that immediately moved in in great numbers. Fortunately, in 1952, Foster White began daily systematic recording of the birds in this area to delight his eyes and those of anybody who visits this area. There were increasing numbers of short-legged, strange-billed black skimmers that settle on the bars at low tide. Gull-billed terns nested on the spoil banks. While this tern may not be called colorful, its neat black, white, and gray plumage has great charm. Leased terns nest on the sand surrounding the port waters and suffer devastation annually from people who race thoughtlessly over their nests. Some of the leased terns have been wiser and have moved to abandoned photography pads on the Cape, and there they rear their young undisturbed. Royal terns congregate around the port in great numbers after their nesting activities are completed, perhaps in the West Indies or on the islands off Virginia or Texas. The flaming red-orange bill of Caspian terns puts the yellow bill of a royal tern to shame 
This turn is our largest, as big as a herring gull. Though they are more frequently seen along the ocean beaches, sandwich terns with yellow-tipped black bills sometimes are spotted by alert birders in the port. Of the medium-sized bills, the foresters, which in winter has a black bill, is most frequently recorded here. Another medium-sized tern also loses the brilliant color of breeding time, and the ones that we see in this area usually have dull blackish bills. Here they do not nest, and are birds of passage only, rarely observed except on migration. Another medium-sized tern that adds to confusion among beginners is the rosiette. This breeding bird has a black bill with just the slightest tinge of red at the gate, but sometimes almost half of the bill is very bright red. Because so many people confuse these three last gulls that you have seen in non-breeding plumage, Alan has asked the head of the Department of Ornithology at the Museum of Natural History to work out a series of different points between the three, which may help us all. With the coming of spring, laughing gulls around the port don dark hoods. Their fleshy parts brighten, and their cackling calls delight us. In 1953, Alan Crookshank spotted the first great black back gull at Port Canaveral. Now as many as 80 may be counted in a single day. Great blue herons are numerous at the port. They feed in the shallow waters, and then when the tide isn't conducive of effective feeding, they find a comfortable perch and become motionless as statues. Now when you see a reddish egret at the port, and we can find one there frequently, it is usually darting around with its wings spread and a great, in a graceful dance as it pursues food. But this is the way a reddish egret looks on the nest when it is putting on its full philistiller display for its mate. Sanderlings congregate by the breakwater and on the sands of the beach and the port. There are pale winter shadows here that will become tinged with bright gold as spring advances. These ruddy turnstones were photographed in December and have already lost much of their breeding time uh, vividness, but the pied pattern sets them apart from any other shorebirds. Least sandpipers which look like rolling pebbles as they run along the shore cannot be called colorful, but how neat their mottled brown plumage and how difficult to see are those dull yellow legs that is a chief point used in distinguishing between least and semi-palmated sandpipers. I just love to stalk sandpipers, attempting to approach them for a clo fairly close-up shot without putting them to flight. Willets are also soberly dressed until they fly and display their striking black and white patterns of the wing, but nobody can overlook them because it seems to me they're the noisiest shorebirds we have. <coughs> Black-necked stilts begin to arrive here on their breeding grounds in the first days of March, though their numbers are few until April, and eggs usually are not found until early May. For its bulk, the black-necked stilt has the longest legs of any species in the world, and as you look at this shot, I'm sure you're ready to believe that statistic. A stilt folding its long legs as it settles on its nest is a funny sight. But at last, the red legs folded and with feathers ruffled, the stilt squirms into a comfortable position on its large eggs. Now there are scattered Wilson's plovers around the port all year, but they are very few until March. We find their eggs as early as April 20th. Undoubtedly, those of you who were there today saw some of these. 
Foster White has found marble godwits around the port throughout the summer, but of course none breed here. In the early days of the port, marble godwits were quite rare, but their numbers have built up beautifully over the years. A shorebird attracted to our coast by the port is the avocet. They often gather in groups to feed, swinging their long curved bills from side to side as they stride through shallow water. Just enjoy looking at this avocet feeding by itself and enjoy its handsome plumage and note its fancy bluish legs. <coughs> Though avocets do not nest here, I could not resist showing you a close-up of this which is one of my favorite birds on its nest in the great Bear River refuge of Utah. Even more startling to look at than a still or an avocet is the oyster catcher. Just look at its striking eye and its red hot poker bill. They nest fairly close to us down on the spoil banks near Sebastian Inlet. And now let's move to the people places. In the old days, travel here was confined almost entirely to the waterways. Almost every home had a dock and a boathouse, and most boathouses had its pair of barn owls, which are frequently called the flying rat traps. Now most of the boathouses are gone, and the barn owls, alas, are gone too until we know of very few pairs that continue to live and breed here and to catch rats. Screech owls, on the other hand, are quite numerous, and they nest in boxes in our gardens or in natural cavities. We always look forward to the day when the young screech owls come out of their nursery hole and perch on a nearby branch. Each one seems to have an individual personality, even at that tender age. No sooner do Carolina wrens begin to sing in spring than we hang a clothespin bag in our carport. Confiding and friendly, they have raised many families there, and we find them fascinating birds to, work, uh, to watch. To most people of Central Bavard, the cardinal is probably the best liked bird. It is also a real help in controlling the insect pests that eat some of our garden plants. A mockingbird, which is our state bird, sings just as beautifully in the autumn when it is sit setting up a uh, feeding territory for winter as it does in spring when it is courting a mate. It is interesting to list the songs that a mockingbird, which is really skilled, can imitate. One year we had one that clearly imitated at least 14 species, and I've heard of other people who have even more skilled uh, mimics in their gardens. Sometime in March, the great crested flycatchers arrive, loudly shouting their presence. Often they take mailboxes or newspaper cylinders for their nests rather than the boxes which we prepare especially for them. Anybody who discovers a male ciliated woodpecker, for he does all the nest building, digging a hole in his garden feels highly honored. This is our largest woodpecker, a frequent target for law-breaking gunners, and a species which is disappearing here in Central Brevard because of that unlawful shooting. Red-bellied woodpeckers live in our gardens throughout the year and often visit our feeders. A few red-headed woodpeckers nest here, but when autumn comes, most of them leave us. We have seen so many of them on the Rollins campus in Winter Park that we suspect they all go to college in winter. <laughs> Though we lose the redheads, after the nesting season, another woodpecker, the yellow-bellied sapsucker, moves in to take its place. Hermit thrushes that nested in the cool, moist conifer woods of the north often accept the hospitality of our bird bath. So do the oven birds. 
We think of them as insect eaters. But Foster White has persuaded some of them to accept breadcrumbs from him. And once in a while, one has taken grain from our bird feeder. Since we learned to put white millet in cages made of crab trap wire, most of us entertain a good population of painted buntings all winter. Indigo buntings join them, that is the painted buntings, in the cages. Most all winter, they, I'm sorry, I'm getting behind time here, aren't I? This is the indigo bunting. Most all winter, they are a bright foxy brown, but as spring approaches, the tips of their feathers break off, revealing that gorgeous indigo color. Yellow-billed cuckoos arrive in April, and they are heard far more often here than seen, but their neat plumage and beautifully patterned tail adds up to real beauty, so it's well worth your time to spend uh, several minutes in searching for one whenever you hear it. Spring migration of land birds is seldom spectacular in the Cape area, but let a brilliant male scarlet tanager visit your bird bath, and you certainly feel spring migration has been a great success. In the ranch lands west of Coco, meadow larks with their modest and sober backs, but startling breasts of burning yellow slashed with black velvet bees make them a favorite of us all. On the bare patches of the ranch land killdeers congregate to feed and later disperse and nest in the same kind of country. Black bands across their white chests and their red eyes add up to conservative but genuine beauty. The population of bluebirds here fluctuates alarmingly. This has been a very poor year locally for them, but hopefully when spring comes, we will be able to find a nest or two in a wood, an abandoned woodpecker hole, either in a fence post or a dead tree. In 1955, the first cattle egrets in Brevard County were spotted. In May of that year, Foster White, Bill Houston, Allen, and I uh, took a trip to uh, uh, Lake Helen Blazes. And on the way back down the river, Allen went ashore on Bird Island in Sawgrass Lake. There he found four nests of cattle egrets. And here is one in breeding plumage. But in the summer, of, uh, I've gone too far here. We'll go back and look at the cattle egret a little more. In the summer of 1961, Lon Ellis located a great cattle egret roost on Merritt Island, west of Georgiana. Many an exciting evening followed as a whole crew attempted to make an accurate estimate of the number of birds congregated there. We believe that at least 35,000 cattle egrets inhabited that roost for a short time. And just think of that, only six years after the first one was spotted in Brevard County. In 1963, NASA and the United States Bureau of Sports, Fisheries, and Wildlife established the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. With later additions, this refuge, which now stretches for some 35 miles along the ocean front, and altogether encompasses about 88,000 acres of rich open waters, superb marshes, and wild hammock country, is to all conservationists one of the finest happenings of NASA and the Moon Project to keep the human environment good while reaching forward to the exploration of space can only be called magnificent. It is just as essential for waterfowl such as this mallard to have a place to winter as it is for them to have a suitable place to nest. And when you look at 27 eggs in a single gadwall nest in a, near a perari pothole, you can understand why the beautiful new Merritt Island refuge is so important for waterfowl. For when winter comes, they all have to get out 
of the ice-bound north. Little ruddy ducks are abundant on the refuge in winter. Soon the males will assume this ruddy plumage and the bright blue bills that look as if they had been enameled and indeed many people think the wildlife people catch them and paint their bills. Of all American ducks, the wood duck is most colorful and many people consider it the most beautiful duck in the entire world. Blue wing teal, which appear to have a delicate plum-like bloom on their plumage at breeding time, are numerous on Merritt Island. They are swift flying little ducks that offer a great challenge to the skill of sportsmen. Here a drake shoveler accompanies a duck as she feeds by tipping up in shallow water. Ring necked ducks are very abundant on Merritt Island, but the lesser scop, which winter here in great rafts, are the most numerous of any of our local species. Now and then a Canada goose visits this area, but it is a refuge here, although as near to us as the west coast of Florida, they winter in considerable numbers. When an area is protected for game species, whether birds or mammals, other species move in. When spring arrives, now and then, a tropical-looking purple gallinule is discovered here. Double-crested cormorants rear their young in this area. And don't dismiss this species as one lacking in color, for at the breeding season, the cormorants are decked with vivid Italian blue at the gate, and even the lining of the mouth is deep blue. At the same time, the fleshy parts of the throat as well as the bill, become bright orange-yellow. Coots are abundant here in winter, and a few of the angry red-eyed birds nest on the refuge. What their parents lack in color is made up for by the weird colors of their bald-headed offspring. <coughs> Now, beautiful photographs of common egrets are literally a dime a dozen. So instead of showing you a beautiful one, I am showing you a photograph you may find interesting. At the height of the breeding time, the lowers of this bird turn bright apple green. And here you can see it, though you have usually seen the lowers looking either yellowish or blackish. Alan Kirkshank, Sam Grimes, and a lot of others are wonderful photographers here in the state of Florida who are nationally known, have made genuine masterpieces in photographing a snowy egrets. But I doubt if any of them, maybe they wouldn't even show you a picture like this, but perhaps you haven't seen a snowy egret with its lures bright cherry red. It's truly a beautiful sight. And now Ken is going to change the cylinders for us. I have seen the feet of snowy egrets also, uh, quite red, not as red as the lower, but the lowers, but looking as if glazed yellow paper had been crumpled, uh, crumpled and then put in uh, red dye. Now once they assume adult plumage, White ibis don't change their plumage pattern for breeding, but they do change their fleshy parts. This fellow is at the very peak of perfection. His blue eye is intense in color, and look how beautifully red his face and legs are. For those of us who photograph in color, we just love to find a bird at the very peak of its breeding time, plumage, and color. Louisiana herons are very common here, but you rarely see them with those white head uh, plumes erected. But this bird incubating its eggs really uh, appears to wear a crown worthy of an Aztec prince. The eyes of many birds to be enjoyed, and I find the eyes of a yellow-crowned night heron particularly worth study. 
when they're young, by the way, their eyes are not as beautiful as they are when they, they uh, grow into the fully adult plumage. As for the eyes of leaf bitterns, their position in the head is enough to startle anybody. Just imagine being able to point your beak straight toward the zenith and at the ta same time see your yellow toes down on the ground. Not many years ago, a sight like this, a half dozen hungry young brown pelicans in a nest was not an unusual sight. It could be seen anywhere from San Francisco Bay, down the Pacific coast, all along our Gulf Coast, up the Atlantic coast as far as Cape Romaine in South Carolina, and a few even into North Carolina. But unfortunately, they are becoming very rare everywhere, and only in East Florida do we still find large flourishing colonies. An adult brown plumage, uh, brown pelican in full breeding plumage is really an interesting sight and how poor our land will be if this bird goes into extinction and is lost forever. They may be clumsy and funny looking when they're perched, but no bird is more beautiful in the air. <coughs> White pelicans are seen every month of the year here in Florida but they have never been known to nest here. The ones that remain during the summer are simply non-breeding birds. But in spite of the fact they don't nest here, I couldn't resist showing you a few breeding sh feeding shots of white pelicans, which I made at Lake Bodoin Refuge in Montana. Here a tiny young pelican goes after its dinner. As they grow older, the woolly youngsters hurry out to meet the food bearing parent but getting food is so exhausting so the young just lies down on the job but just let that parent try to get away while there's the least bit of food left in the, the crop and the young no matter how the adult twists and turns the young bird hangs in perhaps the ornithologists among you will be surprised as I was to see a large young pelican fed by a parent still wearing the breeding time plate on the bill. I had assumed this always fell off before the eggs were even hatched. So you can often learn things that aren't known when you photograph birds. The excitement of the unexpected is always a spur to the birding group. Late one afternoon, a few years ago, a blue goose arrived on our riverfront. It was so weary, it just stood there while I walked up and took its picture. Once a great rarity here, fulvous tree ducks are recorded in this area almost every year now. Scarcely an autumn passes that we do not uh, uh, spot a bright rufous hummingbird somewhere in our garden pausing there briefly on its way south after perhaps having nested as far away as Alaska. The first white-winged dove in this particular area was recorded when a hunter shot one in 1957. Since then, we have had a steady stream of records. A year ago, one came to our feeder and stayed there about 10 days during December but then it disappeared the very day before our Christmas bird count. When hurricanes brush our coast, knotty turns are often swept into Port Canaveral. So are sooty turns, and one that died after being stormed mauled in 1960 became the first sooty turn in Dr. Henry Stevenson's skin collection at FSU. Yellow-billed blackbirds appear with increasing frequency in this area, and their bright yellow heads impress all who see them. Brewer's blackbirds, also from the west, are far less spectacular, though their bright, light-colored eyes make a dramatic contrast to their shiny black plumage. On January 3, 1967, we became the hosts 
for the first record of a razor bill in this area. It occupied one of our bathtubs where it ate an astounding amount of fish until it recovered its strength. Then it was banded and released before a crowd of 65 birders at Port Canaveral on January 7, 1967. And yes, I better point out the fact that the auk is the one on the left, not the right. <laughs> this winter, many of us had triple finches at our bird feeders for the very first time. With the building of breakwaters in Florida, purple sandpipers, which we think of as a genuine northern species, have been recorded here. I photographed this particular purple sandpiper on the Sebastian Inlet breakwater. Chan Young observed one at Sebastian Inlet as late as June 21st, 1957. This is not Dave Thornton. <laughs> no rare visitor to our area is brighter than a male western tanager. This one was shot in cocoa by a boy with a BB gun. We obtained the skin and gave it to Dr. Glenn Wolfenden at Florida Southern. Though the story of wildlife in this area for centuries after discovery is lost in the midst of time, since the space age began for us with the launching of the first American satellite in 1958, changes from now on will be well documented. I am, not, I am sure not one of you failed to experience a lift of your heart when you heard one of the astronauts aboard Apollo 8 as the receding spacecraft speeded toward the moon and gave him a view of the entire world. And he said, the earth looks so small and so much of it is covered by water. We had better take care of this home of ours. As building went forward on the Cape, great blocks of natural scrub were left undisturbed between complexes. There, wildlife lives on as it did in primeval times. Scrub jays, disappearing in most parts of Florida, are positively abundant there. And I know of no place of equal size in the entire state of Florida where more marsh hawks hunt for rodents in winter. So as the earth turns, Wildflowers continue to bloom in our fresh waters. Bright life springs from the more moist round earth and young creatures are born and grow up. The season of maturity comes on schedule and ripe sea oaks uh, still bend before the winds on the ocean dunes and bright red maple seeds ripen on the swamp maples. When winter comes, as proved by this photograph, which I took early this month in Coco. <laughs> Bobcats still hunt along the shore of the Indian River. And one dull, humid dawn, after Bobcat had eaten the neighbor's Muscovy ducks, it listened intently while I told it how beautiful it was, and it let me photograph it in spite of poor light and a fogging land. Changes have come to this area with shocking abruptness. The town of Merritt Island, for instance, was just a tiny hamlet 10 years ago. Now its population is greater than all Florida when it became a state in 1845. But the Indian River Audubon Society members do their utmost to bring about sound planning for the influx of human population and Either of these have gotten mixed up. Resources. We are so fortunate in this Indian River Audubon Club to have a lively group of dedicated, able young people to lead it. We truly appreciate them and owe every one of them a great debt of gratitude. 
Well, changes take place here, and we can continue to hope for continued visits to our area by spoonbills. A flock of about 125 of them made their headquarters for many months last year in the very shadow of Complex 39 from which the Apollo moon ships are launched. We all continue to experience a lift of the heart as common egrets rise from a marshy shore. Hopefully today's efforts will help to keep the whisper of many wings in the skies as birds follow the uncharted paths on their travels as their ancestors have done few time gone by. And I thank you very much for listening to me so long. proceeding was recorded in January 1970 at the Florida Audubon Society annual convention which is held in Cocoa Beach, Florida. The following recording of Alan Cruikshank was made in January 1970 at the annual state convention of of the Florida Audubon Society, which was held in Cocoa Beach, Florida. I think it's quite obvious that Mrs. Icon has Carl very well trained. He understands our status in life. As Dade Thornton said, behind each man there's a great woman, especially in the Thornton family. <laughs> I know you didn't come here to hear me talk. Most of you came here with just one idea in your mind. That was to hear some of the results of the National Christmas Bird Count. For those who are new in the room, every Christmas bird count in all of the United States, Canada, uh, comes to Rockledge, Florida, believe it or not. And there my desk is piled high with this mass of data. Now, so many people have been asking me that I just jotted down as far as I could see. Remember, I have almost a thousand bird counts on my desk right now. And when you get a thousand reports piled up on your desk without a computer, even though I have a wonderful wife, it's still a lot of work to be done. But I tried to jot down the at least the 15 highest counts in the country. Of course, I bow my head in shame when I went to California and told them how Coco had had the highest count in the United States, uh, in fact, in the whole continent for at least 12 years. I told them how we did it, and shock troops and specialized people that just looked for one species all day, and that's all they had to do. We didn't care if they saw another bird. And San Diego has always been one of my favorite areas, and I told them, if you got organized, you could beat us. Well, they believed me for a change, and they got organized, and this year they set a new national record with 224 <coughs> species of birds. And that is a terrific list. Remember, a few years ago, some cities were bragging about the highest count in the United States at 150 species, but those days are gone forever. And unless the Earth shifts its orbit a little bit and changes the climatic conditions of Florida, I'm afraid San Diego will always be way at the top of the list. But my hat is off to a good organization by a wonderful ornithologist, Guy McCaskey. Now, second in the list, I can smile at this one, was Coco, Florida. <laughs> San Diego, California had 224. Cocoa, Florida had 196 species. I'm astonished that we had that many because uh, a week before I had predicted to the newspapers that we would drop down to about 180 species. It was quite obvious that birds were miserably low. And I was getting the feeling that maybe we were reaching Rachel Carson's silent spring. But it's wise not to jump to conclusions and just hold back and look over the situation because we'd go out in the uh, groves where we'd normally find tremendous flocks of warblers, particularly myrtles and palms, and we'd see a half dozen birds and a dozen birds. And on the morning of the count, uh, my party starts off where the St. John's River runs into Lake Poinsett, where the waters are still relatively unpolluted. 
And one of the great sights all the visiting ornithologists enjoy are three to four thousand to five thousand white ibis coming up the river uh, early at dawn out of the roost. And this year we had instead of three to five thousand birds, we had forty birds fly by. Instead of groves full of warblers, we had groves where we'd search and look for an individual bird. But apparently we had 55 really good eager beavers out from 4 o'clock in the morning, some of them, until after dark. And by combing the area and picking up one of this and two of that and one of that, we finally ended up with 196 species. Now Monterey, California was not far behind with 189. And then came another one of my favorite areas, Freeport, Texas, with 188. And uh, they have great potential in Freeport, Texas, and they may get above that. And then I was very pleased to see, in spite of the uh, disastrous oil spillage on the Pacific coast, that Santa Barbara came in fifth with 178, and Drake's Bay, California, with 176. And then uh, California puts Florida to shame because they have a whole list of uh, groups here until we come to number 10 and then we have a tie for uh, 10th place uh, among four counts three of these from florida coot bay florida jacksonville florida st mark's florida and cape charles virginia all had 166 species and let me say that's the highest count jacksonville has ever obtained and i think with a little more organization jacksonville has great possibilities well, that's the general story. I could go on and on with it. But you know, when Frank M. Chapman, the Dean of American Ornithologists, when I was a boy and he was God to us, when he organized the Christmas bird counts in 1900, I'm sure he had no idea how this project would grow. Because that first year, 25 reports were submitted to the National Audubon Society, which at that time was called the National Association of Audubon Societies, and only 27 people participated. Now keep those figures in mind. 25 reports, 27 people. Last year I received over 900 reports. I had to reject a few because some are obviously incorrect and we published over 850 and the published reports will indicate that 15,000 people participated in the Christmas bird counts. But now don't let that figure fool you. For instance, this year, Coco reports that 55 people participated in the Indian River Ottoman Society bird count centered at Coco. But that's only a small story because for the next few days, the phone kept ringing and every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the area, even outside our circle, kept phoning in and they wanted us to know that on that day, they had three painted buntings on their feeder and the boat-tail grackle landed in their yard and by the time you end up added up these multitude of reports instead of the 55 part people participating in the cocoa count i would say hundreds of people were interested and would stop me on the street and tell me what they saw so to me of utmost importance in the christmas bird count not the scientific value the ornithological data but to me of utmost importance is the generation of interest it creates a terrific amount of interest and i think many of you will be surprised how, many, how much interest it does arouse uh, among birders, among Audubon societies, bird clubs, other nature organizations. And to the field ornithologist today, the Christmas bird count has become as much a part of Christmas, and this is the truth, as the Christmas tree, plum pudding, Santa Claus, and even the Christmas carol. And I have club after club, uh, editor after editor, uh, writing me from his local area, pointing out to me, and I just put down a few quotes here, I went through some of the letters, the most exciting birding event in the entire year. Now that's coming from a great big Audubon Society, the most exciting birding event in the entire year. The World Series of Baseball, one fellow called it. Another one said, no other activity in our 365 days creates as much excitement and interest and enthusiasm as the Christmas bird counts. So adding, one fellow says, adding the total list at the end of the day is more exciting than the election returns at the end of election day. Uh, then they end up with such nice statements as thanks for letting us participate. We are already looking forward to next year. 
So I think you'll agree with me, with that kind of enthusiasm being aroused, that is of primary importance to the National Audubon Society and to all conservation groups. Now, one thing we overlook is that no other activity of the National Audubon Society, with a possible exception of the wildlife lecture series, and remember, a lot of people do not realize this, but the Audubon Wildlife Lecture Series is the largest lecture series in the entire world. As our very backbone, we begin with something like 250 cities with five lectures each across the continent. You multiply that, and then remember, that's the backbone, and as a, if a lecturer has a free day or even a free afternoon, he's worked into other programs, and so the Audubon Wildlife Lecture Series has turned out to be the largest lecture, uh, the largest lecture series of any kind in the entire world. Now, what does that mean? The Christmas bird count uh, might be second to that, and we've never added up the newspaper space. It may be first, and if uh, publicity is of great importance to an organization, and the advertising companies make an awful lot of money on the business, so it must be. Uh, the Christmas bird counts receive more space in the newspapers of North America than any other activity of the Audubon Society, with the possible exception of the lecture series. Right at this convention, person after person has come up to me and opened up a newspaper and showed a complete spread, one complete page of the local Christmas bird count. And we've gone beyond the local newspapers because we get write-ups in Time Magazine, Life Magazine, uh, National Geographic, and even last year in the Wall Street Journal, as you notice. And so it's reaching way back, and we've even gone way into Sports Illustrated. And uh, think of it, Sports Illustrated coming out and writing up the Christmas bird counts, and to show you the enthusiasm that's generated, uh, they sent a fellow uh, down to cover our Christmas bird count, and he told me when he came down, he thought, what a ridiculous job, I'm going on a bird count and he arrived with little enthusiasm. By the end of the day, he was running around, and what, what brought him around was he spotted the, uh, the first uh, leaf bittern or something of the day, and he was so excited that he had spotted this that the next day he went to Orlando, bought a pair of binoculars, and in his article for Sports Illustrated, he said, I've become an ardent bird watcher, and I will never go on a fishing trip or any trip without my bird binoculars. So I'd say of second importance to the, uh, of the Christmas bird count is the terrific amount of uh, publicity across the country and very good and very favorable publicity. Now needless to say, and we have to keep this in mind, all this interest creates a deep conservation interest. A few people have poo-pooed this idea. They say they're just a bunch of bird watchers. But I want you to realize that as boys, and we went together on Christmas bird counts, Roger Peterson and Bob Allen and myself and the whole bunch around New York, our primary interest was the Christmas bird count, but when we realized we wanted to preserve what we were enjoying so much, we became conservationists. And when you get this terrific population across the United States interested in the bird count, uh, many of the active conservationists today got involved in their first attempt by attempting to protect the birds they enjoyed seeing. We all fight hardest for those things we feel very important. Now to run along, I know we're behind schedule here, so I want to try to take less time than I'm allotted. Of what most important to the uh, Christmas bird count is our, an increase or a contribution to our scientific knowledge. The Christmas bird count has actually been called the largest cooperative wildlife survey in the entire world. Now think of that, the largest cooperative wildlife survey in the entire world. Do you realize over 70 years, 70 years, the mass of data that has been accumulated by the Christmas bird count and how rewarding it would be, how wonderful it would be if we could just today go to any publication and find out the statistics that we now have on the Christmas bird count about the last century, the century before, and that would be enough. And going back, in years to come, this data will be of utmost importance in scientific research. Uh, when you go to the American Ornithologist Union conventions, a few of the super scientific people will tend to uh, soft 
speak on the Christmas bird count and its importance, and then right after giving that statement, uh, person after person gets up and gives his scientific paper and then tries to back up his theory by quoting figures from the Christmas bird count. And I always sit back and smile. They tell you it isn't of importance, and then when they come to a big theory they want you to accept, they put forth the figures of the Christmas bird count as backing them up in these observations. And I hope most of you realize that a lot of scientific papers have been written based on the Christmas bird count. To some degree, the hunting regulations are influenced by the Christmas bird count statistics. I've been reassured over and over again by my many friends in Washington that they go over these Christmas bird counts very carefully. And if they, if they see that the common snipe is starting to decrease in numbers, then they're going to bound to cut down on the hunting season and the bag limit. Uh, the mass of data contributed by the uh, Audubon Christmas bird count is so important that now the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at Patuxent has considered it uh, important enough to be put on computers. And they're going back and taking all this data and being put, uh, starting to put it on the computers. Now, I don't know if you realized how this Christmas bird count has really developed. Uh, when I was a boy and started my first Christmas bird count in 1922, I'm starting to give away my age, but in 1922, I went out with the John Burroughs Audubon Club in a high school in New York, and I participated in my first bird count, and Joe Hickey was on it, and John Orth, the head of the Bear Mountain Museum uh, uh, Parks in New York State. And from that experience, we got so excited, we became bird watchers, and finally we became so uh, excited about bird watching and ornithology, and we wanted to protect all this beauty and excitement that we became conservationists. So remember, all these things are interrelated and inter interdependent, just as ecology is in the out of doors. Now, I'm the first one to admit that humans are involved, and the minute humans are involved, there are some errors. So I will not say that no errors occur in the Christmas bird count. But that really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if somebody had a white-winged dove up at Mount Dora. It's important to the people at Mount Dora, and it's exciting. It creates a lot of enthusiasm. But supposing they were wrong, that doesn't matter, because that's not what we're looking for. But when the Christmas bird counts come in, and somebody suddenly says, a uh, purple sandpiper was spotted at Jacksonville on the breakwater. And that in itself wouldn't be important. But when they tell you a uh, uh, purple sandpiper was spotted on the breakwater at Cocoa at Port Canaveral, and then they tell you a purple sandpiper was spotted on the Sebastian Inlet breakwater, and then they finally tell you one purple sandpiper occurred on the Keys, way down at Key West, then I don't think anybody in the room would question the fact that there was a flight of purple sandpipers for the first time in history into the state of Florida in enough numbers to be scattered around the state, and that shows the extension of range or a flight of birds that were once considered accidental even as far south as New York. I remember when I was a boy, they wouldn't accept the record of a professor at Princeton who reported a purple sandpiper around New York. Then they started to increase in numbers, and they started to appear on the uh, breakwaters of uh, New Jersey, and apparently we carried it a little farther, and we find as they created breakwaters down the coast, and there was enough time to have the marine algae grow on these breakwaters in the right feeding conditions. If a purple sandpiper came in and liked the conditions, it came back next year, and so with the creation of the breakwaters down the coast, the purple sandpipers came down the coast. Now when they suddenly report, that at Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, 500 bohemian waxwings appeared. You might think, well, the person had one mint julep too many. And, but then when Quebec tells you the same thing, and Montreal tells you the same thing, and Ottawa, and Toronto, and Winnipeg, and pretty soon uh, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, and Connecticut, and New York, then I don't think anybody would question the fact that there was a tremendous, unprecedented invasion of bohemian waxwings into the United States and to eastern Canada which is very unusual. So I want to stress that it's the big overall picture, the extension of a bird's range, great flights, and why are these flights? Then the ecologist comes in and the botanist tells us there was a big failure of cone crops in the spruce woods of uh, northern Canada, and therefore this big flight of crossbills, for instance, that there was a great uh, disaster in the lemming population of the Arctic, and down came the snowy owls, 
and we start to correlate the whole picture, it becomes of great importance. Now, I want to stress that uh, human nature being what it is, we tend to make this a competition. So I always joke, Coco got the highest count in the United States, and as long as we beat Miami, we don't care what happens in the rest of the United States, you know. And the same as California and Florida have this little rivalry, but that's all in joking. I want you to remember it's not a competition. And I want you to remember that the person in New England that goes out in northern Maine uh, with 40 below zero up at Holton, Maine, or Fort William, and they go out with 40 below zero and plow around all day, they are having just as much fun as we are at Cocoa with a tremendous list and ideal sunshine weather. And I get some of the most enthusiastic reports. Think of a fellow, a school teacher at Cambridge Bay Northwest Territory. He's a teacher up in Northwest Territories. He's assigned up there. His Christmas week comes, it's a holiday. So what does he do? He goes out on a Christmas bird count every day and he decides He'll take the biggest day in the entire week and he'll report that. He'll forget the rest of the week and send in the best day in the entire week. So every day he wakes up at dawn, which there comes at 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, and he goes until sundown at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he gets, in his, uh, gets on his snowshoes and he plows all over the place, and at the end of the week he picks out his biggest list and he reports to me. He says, three days I didn't see a single bird. I was out from dawn till dark. I didn't see a single bird. And he said, the biggest list was on the fifth day when I went out and I got two species, seven individuals. And he sends that report in. And not only sends that report in, it's very interesting, but he sends in the most enthousi enthusiastic letter of the entire bunch. And he says, I'm already looking forward to next year and I'm making my plans. Maybe I can find three species. <laughs> so you see the possibilities of having a wonderful time in that. Uh, occasionally a skeptic will say to me, well now how is it so many rare birds always show up on Christmas bird counts at no other time of the year? And the answer is very simple if you sit down and analyze it. Do you re realize the number of man hours put in on a Christmas bird count? Do you realize that on uh, this year we had 55 observers out from, let's say, 4 or 5 in the morning until 6 o'clock, 6.30, and some later at night, and you add up the man hours, and you do that right across the country, and you find out that there are more man hours of, of bird watching in the week of Christmas bird count and all the rest of the year combined when you actually analyze it. And so when you have that terrific concentration of bird watching, then uh, you uh, must realize that that's when you'll pick out the very unusual birds. Now re remember that of utmost importance is the normal picture. We're not interested in the free. If you get a uh, banana quit suddenly coming in the Crookshank yard in Coco, or some bird like that, that's a freak, that's an accidental bird and it's exciting. But what we want is a study of the normal picture and the fluctuations in population. Uh, we want the great flights, such as this year. Just before the Christmas count, uh, my wife said there's a funny looking bird on the feeder. She didn't have her binoculars with her and she rushed to get the binoculars. We put the glass on the feeder and there were, uh, two, purple, there were two purple finches. And then what happened? The Christmas bird count came in and five different parties, as I recall, scattered around Brevard County all saw flocks of purple finches. And so there was unquestionably a wonderful flight of purple finches into Brevard County. So we get a picture of the flight. Now why did those purple finches come down? In the case of the evening grosbeak, it's suspected that the winter feeding has encouraged them to come into the feeders. More have survived, therefore a better population, and more have come back the next year. And then, as I mentioned, the extension of a range. Now, I know you're behind schedule, so I'm cutting out a couple pages on this, but let me say this. Uh, every year, every year, the last week of the, uh, the, just a week before the Christmas bird count, I get desperate calls, even from a professional like Russ Mason. And he says, Dear Alan, when are the days of the Christmas bird count, and when is Coco? And then he writes early in the season, he wants this for his official publication to put it in, and I see a lot of compilers in the room, and uh, so right now I'm going to announce the days for next year. <laughs> so those of you who are going to get high blood pressure wondering what to put in your bulletin, please pick out a pencil right now, and next season, believe it or not, see, we, we really jump ahead of this thing. 
Next season we begin on Tuesday, December 22nd, and we run through Sunday, January 3rd. Tuesday, December 22nd through t Sunday, January 3rd, and for all those stout-hearted people who have, uh, like to get on the Coco Count, and if anybody's interested, just contact me. Uh, our Coco Count for next year, you see how we trust the weather, we're depending on Dr. Shep and these others keeping the satellites in the right place. And our total count next year is on Tuesday, December 29th. Now, uh, one other thought I want to leave. The most important thing for you in the re uh, various Audubon societies around the state is to remember not to pick just a willing worker for the compiler of your Christmas bird count. He or she may be the most wonderful person in the world, best person in the whole club. But if he doesn't know his bird distribution and his bird identification, then you're asking for trouble. So I would stress that when you take a Christmas count compiler, that you pick somebody who knows how to identify birds in, in the field. We all make mistakes. But pick a compiler who knows how to identify birds in the field, and even more important, pick a person that realizes the seasonal variation in birds, and that if you see a wood thrush at Christmas time, even in Florida, you're seeing something unusual, and therefore you question the observer. We want big lists and important lists, but we want them to be accurate. And I won't mention any organizations, but when some club in Florida sends me a report and tells me they had 35 to 40 common turns on their list in Florida, but they didn't see a single Forster's turn, then I know there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Because we have to search through our hundred and so Forster's turns in the Cocoa area, and when I'm at St. Petersburg or Naples or Fort Myers, we search through the Forster's turn, which is the abundant medium-sized turn in Florida in winter, and we hope to pick out one or two common turns. So the minute a person tells me they're seeing nothing but common turns, it sounds good. Naturally, the common turn should be the one around, but I know they do not know their bird distribution. The same with a list in South Florida sending me a list with 30 common mergansas on it. And I've been in Florida living for 17 years. I've been visiting Florida for over 35 years and I have yet to see a common merganza in the state of Florida. They do occur, particularly up at Jacksonville, St. Mark's, up in the northern end of the state, but the minute anybody south of the northern t uh, section of the state reports a common merganza, I'm pretty confident to begin with that it is a red-breasted merganza because a red-breasted merganza is an abundant bird all the way down to your keys. So I, don't wanna, I, want, I can't stress more seriously to look over your Christmas count compilers. Luckily, all across the country, we're getting better and better compilers every year. Those who are conscientious, those who know bird distribution. And just as important as identification and knowing the bird distribution and the seasonal variation, pick a person with enough courage to reject a report. It's pretty hard on me to receive counts from uh, Every city practically in the United States, and as I say, this year I'll receive over 900, and it's pretty hard for me to get a letter from a compiler and saying, on our list you'll find two birds, we hope you'll reject them, we don't believe they are correct. Now if the local compiler doesn't have enough guts, let me put it right in there correctly, to reject his own local record, he knows his observers, he knows his bird distribution in that area very seriously, uh, then he should not be a compiler. And they say, oh, we, we don't want to start any friction in the club by rejecting a record. Mrs. So-and-so is such a sweet lady, and she's sure she saw this Brazilian pepper plant or a Brazilian cardinal or something. Uh, the person has to have enough courage. So just let me leave that thought with you, to pick a compiler who knows his birds. He doesn't have to be a world expert as long as he knows birds and more important, bird distribution, and more important, knows his observers and is willing to have enough courage to reject it. Now, I could go on for three days with Christmas bird counts. As I say, I've been doing it since 1922. I grew up with all the editors, uh, beginning way back, 
And everyone warned me, never have anything to do with editing the Christmas bird counts. You'll regret it. You'll be the most hated man in the U.S. But finally, they turned it over to me and show you how soft-hearted I am. When I took over, Chen Robbins had just published a letter, uh, an article in Audubon Magazine, Audubon Field Notes, and he said, we have now reached 400 Christmas bird counts. That's the maximum the Audubon Society and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can accept. 400 bird counts. So Soft-hearted Crookshank didn't want to kill the enthusiasm, so I kept accepting them, accept, accepting them, and as I say now, I received 900, and the price keeps going up. We had to give $500 last year just to hold the binding together. It's getting so big. So I hope the people in this room who send me reports and want me to publish Guatemala and Honduras and Europe and Asia, and I re receive reports this year from 17 foreign countries, I want you to remember that we're pretty well saturated with Christmas counts from North America. But don't get me started. Thanks very much. <laughs>